uh, be careful what you say. Don't criticize Microsoft. All right, because it's all documented right here and it's going to be uploaded for everybody to see. OK. So uh, speaking about security, now we have Power BI actually can integrate with micro, something called Microsoft Cloud App Security. So how is that cool? Well, it's cool because it brings some additional security um, features. For example, you can, if there is some suspicious user activity, if got suspicious user, that suspicious user is generating some suspicious activity. Now we can create custom policy to alert us on things like this, or we can identify risky user sessions. All right, so if your organization is, uh, you know, kind of interested in improving security, and it should be, and you want to go beyond the typical things like multi-factor authentication, all that cool stuff, that will be the last, the next frontier for you guys to explore. Okay, all right. And then the other thing is that those of you who are don't want to go cloud now, my management wants to stay on-prem because of security or licensing, whatever reasons. These people are using Power BI Report Server, which essentially is a add-on to SSRS. It doesn't get that much attention as Power BI. It's lacking in feature. So Microsoft has released every, have updates every four months, and they just released the January 2021 update of Power BI Report Server. So um, you can take a look at that, see what kind of goodies they got in there. Any questions? Questions? Well, my chat window is ah, there. We go. Okay. All right. Got no questions. So today, Paul Turley, are you on the uh, call? I just had to find my mouse. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, there. Tio? <laughs> I'm great, Paul. Good. Glad, glad to see you, sir. I'm about to turn this to you. So I just wanted to say that this meeting, uh, Paul Turley, um, you know, somebody that I know for many years, MVP, um, you know, just like me for for many, many years. Well, and not, just, not just like you, Tio. Just like, just like many other people, that's right. <laughs> so he's going to be talking about Power Query. Looking uh, for it, our next meeting is going to be on March 1st. So typically we meet on the first Monday of every month. I'm going to talk about implementing semantic models and I'm going to be actually doing that presentation. Uh, so Paul, I would like to turn this to you. Thank you so much for joining us. He's joining us all the way from where, Paul? Uh, from Ridgefield, Washington. Ridgefield, about, Washington. Yeah, about 25 miles north of Portland, Oregon. Awesome. Floor is all yours. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Um, you know, I as as Tia said, uh, he and I go way back, and uh, I I can honestly say that uh, Tio is one of my heroes in the industry and in the. Did community. you guys hear that? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what? I was I was thinking. Well, before I and I I just was thinking about this today. But, you know, I, I've got my whole bookcase behind me here. This is not, this is real. This is not, uh, you know, a background effect. And my wife forgot that I'm doing a user group presentation and she keeps calling me. Um, and, and I thought, you know, I better have a book from, uh, from Tia Lachiv. And I do right here. Um, it's an old one. So I, this is Applied Microsoft SQL Server 2008 Reporting Services. It's too bad we cannot see it, Paul, because yeah, you're... I, I, I see that the screen is uh, is very, very slow. Kind of froze, you know, I don't yeah, know, probably because... Up? Probably because I think you did this on purpose. You just didn't want you, to show my think, book. No, I want to show your book, <laughs> but I'm still waiting for the image to update. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll try resharing. But you know what? I'm not I'm not sharing yet. So yeah, something's up. 
All right. Well, I'm going to put your book back up on the bookshelf. So we got, we got, we're going to show it. Stuff. Actually, I can see it here after your picture. You know, I can see my stuff in there. All right. Anyway, that's it. Well, I just want to say also, Paul is one of the most, um, I would say, experienced people in the industry. He's going to tell you about himself, but um, you know, he's been doing the, this, for, uh, this for many years. He's written a number of books. Big expert on reporting services now Power BI. So you guys should follow his blog. It's one of those people in the industry that um, you know you must follow, right? So there aren't that many, and one of these people is him, right? So pay attention to what he says, right? <laughs> hey, uh, Tio, since we're obviously having some video problems of some kind, I'm going to drop out of the meeting and rejoin quickly. Cool. I'm going to Just... fill in the pause. Okay, good luck. I'll be right back. <laughs> cool, Paul. Yeah. So, what are we going to talk about now? I'm going to fill in this big pause. Uh, but I'm back. Ah, thank you so much but for I, saving me, Paul. But, but I, the, we still don't see it. Video is still frozen. Shoot. Maybe what you can do, you can actually turn off the camera and share your screen. See how that's going to go. Try that. Now that we've seen you. And sharing my screen. Sure hope this works. Coming up. There we go. We sit. OK, uh, let me just advance a slide that advance. Uh, yes. Okay. Everything advances. We All right. Well, we'll do what we can. Uh, you know, this is technology. It works really well until you need it to. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, again. I uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, just very quickly, I, uh, as Tio said, um, the, the, the best way to uh, connect with me is through my blog. Uh, I, I also uh, spend a little bit of time on Twitter and uh, a little bit of time on LinkedIn, but um, if uh, you will just go to my blog, which is right here, SQL Server BI blog. You can tell I've been doing this a long time because I have BI connected with SQL Server, um, but this is my bio right here. I've been a member of the MVP program since uh, uh, 2009, no, uh, 2011, I believe. So I'm uh, in my uh, 10th year. And uh, blog's been running since 2009. I've had about uh, one and a half million views on my blog, which is uh, which is kind of cool to see that kind of activity and and interest. And I have been working on a a series of blog posts called "Doing Power BI the Right Way," and this uh, for me is really a way for me to kind of get things out of my head and put them in front of people in the community and uh, hopefully to make a worthwhile contribution. I, I really believe in community. I really believe in, in the idea that if we all just share our expertise with each other and, and uh, you know, help each other in the community, that what goes around comes around. And, uh, you know, that doesn't always have to be connected to immediate, uh, you know, revenue or, uh, you know, whatever that is. I, I uh, really believe in the concept of, of community. As you can see, the the next post that I promised to get out is actually on this topic, which is one reason that I promised to sign up. So the material that I'm going to be presenting and uh, some of the demonstrations will be featured in a blog post, which I promise to have on my blog within a week's time by the end of the week. So how about that for a commitment? All right, so we're going to talk about different ways that we can transform and shape data. And I'll be primarily talking about Power Query, but uh, also talking about different options and why it makes sense to use SQL Server or Power Query or Azure Data Factory or uh, and a number of other uh, options that we have um, for preparing, shaping, cleaning, and transforming our data to prepare to build a data model, which of course supports interactive uh, reporting and interactive data exploration. So um, why do we have different query and calculation choices in Power BI? 
Without getting into a lot of details, Power BI really is a collection of technologies. And some of those technologies have been around for, gosh, a good uh, 20 to 25 years. SQL Server Analysis Services um, has been a Microsoft product for, I believe, 23 years, if I'm counting correctly. It was originally released in, uh, in uh, 1998 with SQL Server um, 7.0 as, as OLAP services. And, and I know that you, Tio, go back uh, with these products uh, that far, which, which is about as far as I go back or at least can remember. Mm -hmm. um, analysis services evolved from multidimensional into tabular in memory, taking advantage of, of new hardware capabilities and new technologies. Um, integration services eventually evolved into Power Query in a number of different ways. Reporting services in some ways evolved into the visualization experience that we have in Power BI. So Power BI really is a collection of a lot of stuff, and which means that you have a lot of choices. And with choices come with a lot of decision points, and that can be confusing. So sometimes it's hard to say, these are the best practices, always do this, and, and you know that's the silver bullet approach that will always work. But we're gonna talk about uh, when it would make sense to choose some of these different things. So I just advanced the slide. I just wanna make sure that, that you're seeing the slide that says where you should perform. Yes, we see it, Paul. Good. Good, all right. I know that there was a lot of screen lag and I'm hoping that that has gone away. So when we think about building a business intelligence solution, and that could be uh, with Power BI entirely, where Power BI could be part of that solution. We have multiple opportunities to transform data and to perform calculations on data. And just for this example, let's say that my data source is a SQL database. You know, it could be a data lake, it could be files, it could be, uh, you know, any number of things. But in this example, let's say that it is a SQL data source. So where can I perform transformation? So I can certainly um, transform my data in a very conventional way into a data warehouse. So, you know, we pull it from sources, we stage it, we, we crank it through a, an ETL process uh, using some very conventional approaches, and, and then we land that in a data warehouse. And if that's the case, then we may not have a whole lot more transformation to do on that data if it's in the right shape at the source. Um, However, we also have equal opportunity to transform within the Power BI platform using Power Query. You can see that I've called out the, the name of the language here, M. We're going to talk about M quite a bit. Um, can you transform data in DAX? Well, if you do some web searches and you want to learn how to, I don't know, create a date table or create a calculated column, well, yes, you can certainly perform some transformation in DAX. But uh, some of those, some of those uh, web search results that you might go get might take you back to earlier forms of the technology that we have in Power BI, such as Power Pivot, which is resident in Excel, or it might be SQL Server Analysis Services, where we typically use Visual Studio to do our authoring. And before we really had Power Query as a, a resident, of this ecosystem, we did a lot of this work in DAX. DAX is not really a transformation language per se, but it is possible to do some data transformation. And, you know, can we do a little bit in report visuals? Yeah, you know, there are minor opportunities to, to twist data a little bit. You could use an R visual and you could do some transformation in R, um, but as you can see by the width of that arrow, that, that's not the place where we typically do transformation. How about calculations? We can certainly perform calculations at the source. We can do some calculations row by row in Power Query. But that's what DAX is for. It's really kind of the, the, the bread and butter of, of DAX. And so, you know, people often get a little overwhelmed and confused when they think, oh my gosh, to be able to be good at Power BI, I've got to know SQL, I've got to know M, I've got to know DAX. That's not entirely true. You don't necessarily need to be uh, an expert in all of these languages, but it certainly helps to have a basic understanding. All right, so where's Power Query used? Well, we know that it's used in Power BI Desktop. Uh, when 
Power BI as we know it today was created all of six years ago or so. Power BI desktop was the, the gluing together of Power Query, of the tabular modeling engine, of the DAX editor, and the visualization experience. So uh, this is a very big part of that. Power Query can also be processed in the Power BI service. Now we typically use Power BI desktop to do the query authoring, and then we deploy uh, PBIX files up into the Power BI service. But there are also other opportunities to um, author Power Query queries and to use them in the service, such as Power BI data flows. And Power Query is part of Excel. Uh, back in 2010, it was released as an optional add-in. In 2013, it uh, actually they started baking it into certain editions of of Excel. In 2016, Power Query came with Excel. Every edition of Excel now includes Power Query. So you can just open up an Excel workbook and you can use Power Query to do a lot of the same things that I'm going to show you today. And then we have data flows. Um, the point of this slide is to make the point that Power Query is an extremely, not, not to overuse the word power, but powerful data transformation engine. And different product teams at Microsoft have discovered that it's very plug and playable. It's now being integrated into Azure Data Factory. It's being integrated into other Microsoft products. So it's a very pervasive skill set. All right, so let's just talk very quickly about different ways that you might build a Power BI solution. And much of this really depends on your role and the profile of the types of projects that you work on. So when people ask me, you know, where's the where's the right way to transform your data? You know, how should I how should I build a project? You know, what tools should I use? It depends on what we're trying to do. If you're a self-service analyst, if you're an Excel jockey, or if you have a relatively small project and this is something you need to do yourself perhaps to share with some other people. Then you open up Power BI Desktop, you import, transform, model, visualize, create some measures. It's all done in one place and the things are very, very simple. However, that may not be a truly scalable solution. It may not be the right thing to do if you have millions or billions of rows of data. It may not be the right thing to do if you have hundreds or thousands of users, but this is a good starting point. Well, let's uh, let's look at um, kind of the other end of the spectrum, and that is the modern data warehouse. So if I am working in a truly enterprise environment, I have large volumes of data, and uh, I want to manage that data in a very disciplined way, then I might drop files into a data lake. I could use Azure Data Factory to perform my transformations. And as I said, Power Query might be part of that story, but there are other tools and transformation capabilities in ADF. We might then land that data into a, a data warehouse. Now, I, I created this slide before uh, a, a product called uh, Azure Synapse evolved. And uh, we, what is now called Azure Synapse, was then called Azure Data Warehouse. But the point is that all of the transformation is done and then in Power BI, we simply connect to that data, either import or connect to it through direct query and then visualize and analyze it. Here's the modern, modern enterprise data warehouse. This is using Azure Synapse Analytics, which is uh, a new collection of technologies, all born in the cloud, only available in the cloud, that really builds on the previous um, example. The uh, Azure Data Factory has now evolved into a data store called uh, Azure Synapse. And uh, it uh, we, we make use of other cloud-based technologies like Azure Databricks, et cetera. So truly enterprise scale, all in the cloud. Well, what if we're somewhere in the middle? We don't have a data warehouse. We don't have the budget or the time to create a data warehouse, but we've graduated beyond self-service. This is where Power BI data flows might be the best choice. We can build queries and actually store and optimize um, data entities that you 
author in the web browser in a very similar design environment uh, as Power BI Desktop. So we'll build Power Queries within the browser using the Dataflows designer. Uh, a lot of the work that you do in desktop is very transportable into data flows. Okay, so that covers the whole spectrum. That's the whole opportunity, all the way from self-service through data flows and into the enterprise um, modern data warehouse in the cloud. But we're here to talk about Power Query. So I'm going to, to focus on Power Query and uh, we're, uh, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to admit to you that I, uh, I've, I've kind of cherry picked um, portions of this presentation from uh, from different presentations I've done in the past, and then kind of uh, updated it a bit. So, um, I, uh, I, I want to make sure that we're telling a cohesive story here. One of the things that I strongly, strongly recommend is that you utilize parameters within Power Query. And I'm going to demonstrate how to do this pretty quickly. So within the, in the, the options, I'm going to jump over to uh, RBI Desktop. And uh, I, I have a few uh, files open, but I just want to show you uh, where to go to do this. So if we go to Options and Settings, into options. Under the Power Query editor, I always turn this on. You can see that it was off uh, in, in this particular project, but I rely very heavily on parameters because I want to build a portable solution. I want to build, even if I'm just creating a, a very small self-service project, I want to make sure that that's transportable to uh, a different uh, uh, development environment on a different computer, or that I can pass it on to another developer who can continue to work on it. And we can't do that if I've got it wired up to, to files or uh, a, a, a database um, server that only I have uh, the ability to connect to. So that is um, something that I would strongly recommend. At that point, when I go to connect to a new data source, let's, let's connect to SQL Server you can see that um, I'm now prompted um, to uh, either type in a value or I can create a parameter. So I would typically create a new parameter here if I'm using SQL Server. Um, let's see, I just want, oh, I, I, I have, yeah, I do have my SQL Server instance name. I kind of randomly opened a PBIX file. So you can see that I've already done that. So let's not create a new parameter. Let's just select a parameter and I'm going to say, I'm going to use my SQL Server instance name. And then I might have another parameter for a database name. Now I have an example of this, so I'm not going to build it on the fly right now, but that's where you go to do that. And that is kind of best practice recommendation number one, always use parameters. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the um, M language, and I do want to make sure that I'm using my time wisely here. I'm looking at my clock, which is on Pacific time, and uh, it's easy to add three hours to that. But um, Tia, how late um, should my presentation go? So we can go um, all the way until 8.15, 8.20, so about an hour, okay. hour from now. Okay, good yeah, enough. Plenty of time. So that yep. is 15 my time. I'm just watching the clock and I have to do time zone math in my head while I'm working toward a target. Um, one thing to note, and I, I do have a slide on this later, so I'll move past it, it quickly, and that is that when you connect to any data source, there's going to be, you've got connection information, and then of course there's a, a authentication information. When you're connecting to a secure store of any kind, your credentials are not stored in the PBIX file. So if, if you type in a username and password to connect to you know, SQL Server or a SharePoint list or you know, anything else that requires authentication, um, just know that that information is not stored in the PBIX file. It's safe to send a copy of that file to somebody else or share it uh, through OneDrive, let them open it. They will be prompted for their credentials and that credential cache is stored securely on the developer's machine. Now, when you deploy your um, Power BI data set up into the service, 
and then you'll be prompted for your username and password. Again, those credentials are stored securely within the service. So all of this is managed by Microsoft and it's very, very secure. Um, so you can go to data source settings within the designer and uh, this is where um, you can manage the type of connection and decide whether or not you want to store your credentials. We'll talk about privacy settings uh, as well. Okay, so this is a very typical scenario and I'm going to jump over and show you uh, actually where I took this screenshot from. When you build a Power Query, it's very, very common for you to start building transformation steps. And let me just open this up and uh, remind myself what file we're looking for. Give me just a second. We'll do it right there. Okay, I want to show you, uh, I'm just getting this teed up for my next demo. I want to show you kind of an extreme example of uh, a pattern that's very, very common. So I made a point just to import um, uh, an, an Excel workbook in this case. So you can see that uh, when I went and chose get data, I navigated to my Excel file, that creates this file source um, or, or this source step. Now I make a point to rename a lot of my steps. I'm going to show you an example of that a little bit later. And um, you know, then I, I navigate through my workbook, uh, I choose my, my sheet, the headers get promoted, you can see that the headers uh, end up up at the top here. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is I go and I rename a column. So in this case, I uh, th there was a column name called uh, online sales key right there. And I went up here and I double clicked on it and I renamed that column that caused that column to be renamed. And I go up and I look at this column right here, zoom in. You can see that there's a little icon right next to the, the column name that I just renamed it that says ABC123. And what that tells me is that that column is not strongly typed. It does not have a data type associated with it. So I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I need to go uh, tell Power Query that that is an integer value. So I'm going to change that type. You can see that now it says 123, which tells me that that's now an integer. If you click on that icon, you can see all of your data types here. And then I thought, oh, well, I, I better start renaming other columns because I, I, I want all of these columns to have nice friendly names. So anybody who browses this data, uh, it'll be friendly for them. So I went and renamed the store key. I put a space in there and I changed the data type and then I renamed the promotion key. I put a space in it, changed the data type and so on. You can see that I, I repeated this pattern over and over again, and every time I performed one of these steps, it created all of these different steps. Now, the, the designer is not smart enough to say, oh, you renamed this column and you set it to an integer and you renamed this other column. So it's, it's just putting numbers at the end of all of these things. Now, if I were to uh, refresh this query, I can tell you based on experience that from this small Excel, spreadsheet. This query would take about four and a half seconds to load. Now, if rather than renaming, changing a type, renaming, changing a type, if I were to go back and rename every one of my columns in the same step, it would consolidate all of those actions into one step. Then if I were to change all of my data types at the same time, it would consolidate all of that. And I've done that here, so I don't have to take all of the time to demonstrate that. But look how much cleaner this is. Okay, I have six steps instead of the 35 or whatever steps I had before. And that's great, 
And, uh, you know, if I wanted to, I could go and rename some of these steps to, uh, you know, explicitly uh, kind of self-document what I was trying to do. But what's most important is that if I refresh this query, it does exactly the same thing. I'm going to end up with the same result, but it's going to refresh in just over one second. Okay, so I'm I'm gaining a 5x performance increase by simply consolidating all of my steps together. All right, that's that's a very very key best practice. Bear with me as I get back to my slides. Okay. So, you know, what the heck is going on here? Um, I'll show you an example of where you can rename steps and other, some other things that you can do to kind of self-document your projects. But consolidation is, is, is very, very important. Okay, query diagnostics. How did I figure out that it took four and a half seconds? There's a screenshot that shows the, the duration. Four and a half seconds to run that query. And then after I had optimized and consolidated that it just took over one second. Well, a great feature in Power Query called Query Diagnostics. So you, you have to turn this on before you can use it. And I'm sorry, I am having problems with my user interface here. Okay, I'm going to say not now. We're going to open up Power Query again and see if uh, if I get out of PowerPoint. Let's try transform data again. Okay. So on the tools menu are the diagnostic diagnostic tools. Now um, the way that this works is in the Power Query engine, like other services that you may have used, like SQL Server, like analysis services, there are performance counters. That means that as the low-level components of Power Query are doing their job, they're firing off events. And every one of those events gets a timestamp, it gets all kinds of metadata associated with it. And the um, diagnostics will capture those performance counters and those events and it'll actually write them out to a table. It actually writes them out to a JSON file. And uh, let me just show you quickly how this works. So I'm just going to choose a query. Let's go back to that first query that I was showing you. And I'm going to start diagnostics, all right? So that essentially said, go start capturing events. And I'm going to go up to the Home tab. I'm going to hit Refresh Preview. Okay, that just ran. Go back to tools and stop diagnostics. Now watch my query list on the left side. Okay, it's going to add a new group. And it adds a whole bunch of queries. Now, like I said, these are actually JSON files that it's uh, gone and buried deep in my file system. But if I go down to the detailed, um, the detailed query here, you can see the, the various steps that ran. I always have to kind of fish through these things to remind myself of, of what was going on. It looks like it only captured that last step. But uh, anyway, I, I would strongly suggest that you familiarize yourself with this tool um, to, to get the uh, overall um, timings and the execution time. What I do is, um, is I will group the results of this query and capture the beginning and end time. I'm, I'm sorry, just sum up the exclusive duration. You don't have to get the, the, the actual time. It just, just uh, gives you the number of seconds for each of these steps. And that gives you the uh, timings that I was looking at earlier. Any questions so far? Any questions, guys? I don't see anything in the chat window. Well, I will encourage you all to ask questions freely. We'll uh, check back uh, and look at the chat window. I'm not watching the chat window, but uh, I'll, I'll take breaks and, and ask you. And you know, if you've, you've got a burning question about something that I'm talking about, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and, and just ask. Looks like we've got uh, 
uh, a little over 20 people uh, in the, well, 30 people, if we count all the bubbles there. There is okay. one that just came in, Paul. Uh, those query steps Fernando is asking looked exactly like my first PBI reports. <laughs> those query steps look exactly like my first PBI report. Okay, I got you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's time to clean out your garage then. Uh, it's really easy to make a mess. It's really easy to create a lot of clutter and uh, it takes a little bit of discipline to, to do some housekeeping. You know, I, if I could count the, you know, the number of times that I have, you know, gone and, and, and built a project thinking, yeah, this is pretty well designed. And then I put it on a shelf, I leave it alone for six months, come back and look at it and, and just ask myself, what the heck was I thinking? I have no idea how this thing works. You know, we all do that. And, you know, if it's that hard for us to come back and revisit our projects, how much more difficult is it for another developer to take over? Gotcha. And there is another one, Paul. Bruce is asking, what are the most expensive transformation steps? They are transformation steps that, um, that require data to be placed into memory rather than streaming or chunking that data. So if you think about it, if we go back and look at the ribbon on the transformation ribbon, the most expensive transformation steps would be those transformations that have to pivot or unpivot or transpose data. And, uh, you know, try that sometime, you know, take, take an Excel spreadsheet that has values on columns that you would want to rotate into rows. If you've got, you know, a thousand rows of data like that, it might take you know, 10 seconds to perform a, a transpose columns, but then apply that to a million rows and you might as well go eat dinner while that's running um, because it's it, it just makes the engine work really hard and it has to have all of that data sitting in memory in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And he was asking also, what about splitting data into additional columns? In other words, is that expensive, do you think, Paul? Well, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the bigger the data, the more work the engine has to do. So um, as you add more columns, yes, there's going to be a performance hit. I think more importantly, there's, there's, there's going to be a storage hit as you're storing more and more values in different columns. Um, but, it, but it might be very, very minor. Um, you know, the, the purpose of Power Query is to shape data so that we can put it into a data model. And the tabular data model engine, um, it, it's very, very smart about compressing data, but that data needs to be in the right data types, and it needs needs to be data that, that is compressible. So think about, let's say that, that I have a, a column that has a date, time value in it, both date and time in a single column. That's not very compressible because there, there are a lot of distinct values. And, and if you truly need to know the timestamp, you know, let's say down to the minute, um, as well as the date, then it might make sense to split that into a date column and a time column because both of those are going to have fewer distinct values than the date time version uh, of those values. Let's see, it uh, looks like we're getting a whole bunch of questions now. I'm uh, anxious to answer some of this. Uh, he's asking, uh, Pranam, I think he's asking about if if we can do things like append and um, lookups basically in uh, in Power Query. Oh, I was absolutely. just about to reply to him. The data flow basically is Power Query. You can think about Power Query in the cloud. So you can do append, you can do merges. Right, Paul? Yep, yep. And you know, and if, if you come from uh, an Excel background and you're thinking, oh well, you know, how do I do a V lookup or you know, how do I how do I transpose, you know, using you know like like uh, paste special? Power Query takes you light years beyond those capabilities. Some of them in 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 you know much the same way because you know Power Query is supposed to be native for Excel users but it also has much more powerful capabilities. So anything you can do in Excel, you can certainly do in, in Power Query, but probably uh, more elegantly and, and uh, uh, you know, with, with a whole lot more, um, you know, power behind it. And, and I know that Tio knows the answers to all of these questions, so I'll let you answer some of them. <laughs> sure. So 
All right, well, let's let's talk a little bit about M. Um, so the the language that Power Query generates um, is is called the Microsoft Data Mashup language. It was kind of funny that the the community named the language internally. It was called M, and it wasn't ever supposed to be the the official name of the language. And I, I think it was uh, it was likely Chris Webb, uh, who at the time was a a very well-known MVP in England, now works for Microsoft on the uh, customer advisory team. I, I believe that he coined the, the name and started calling it M before Microsoft named it. Now they just went along with it. So um, do you need to know M? Do you need to write M? Uh, you know, do you need to know it as well as you know SQL or as well as you know DAX? I would say that for beginner to intermediate level Power BI practitioners, the answer is no. I think some familiarity is helpful it's always useful to be able to look under the hood and understand how the engine works, but you don't necessarily need to be able to build one from scratch. Um, but as you get into more advanced needs, more advanced requirements, you can do a lot of cool stuff with them by hand. So we're gonna talk about some of those things quickly. I have a lot of slides on this, which I'm going to, to move through very quickly because like I said, I stole them from an earlier presentation. I don't intend to, to cover all of it. So prioritize your learning. Think about what's important. Don't get overwhelmed. You do not have to be an M expert to be good at Power BI, or at least not to get started. Um, so what is, what is M? Uh, M? M was based on a number of different languages. It, it was actually based on a, uh, a lesser known language in the .NET framework suite called F Sharp. Um, it's it's functional based. Um, it, it is like some other languages in the way that you um, it encapsulate steps and you essentially typically pass an object from one step to another. Most commonly that object is an in-memory table. Um, but if you have 20 steps, each of which handling a table, it certainly does not create 20 copies of of your data in separate tables. Um, just understand that that's kind of the mechanism that it uses to pass these table pointers from one transformation step to another. Um, as I said, it was introduced as uh, as an optional add-in for Excel. It, it uh, was finally baked into Excel 2016. And no matter what version of, of Excel or what edition of Excel you have today, um, Power Query is there. It's it's part of Excel. Um, very extensible. I came up with the 850 function count uh, well over three years ago. We're probably over a thousand different functions today. They uh, extend this language uh, very, very rapidly. But there are some very simple objects, some very simple concepts that are part of the Power um, query M language, things like values, records, lists, tables, uh, queries, and functions. So here's an example. Here is a very, very simple query. A query always starts with let, and it has an in, which causes it to return a value. Um, we declare variables. They do not have to be strongly typed. You don't have to say some variable as table, but you can. And when you set that variable equal to the output of a function or equal to something, um, it gets typed on the fly. So it, it is um, a, uh, a, a loosely typed language, but it has internal optimizations where it's, it's not just interpreted line by line. It, it actually does get compiled. Um, Here's an example of a parameter. The easiest way to figure out how uh, what a parameter looks like is just to go use the user interface to create one. Uh, we don't normally hand uh, create parameters, but you certainly can. And a function really is just a query that takes input. And the syntax for that is as you see here where I put my input parameters, you can have one, you can have as many parameters as you want in parentheses and you pass those into the function using equals greater than, which just forms this little graphical arrow. And then so that just tells you that's going into my query and that just magically turns uh, my query into a function. 
I'm going to go through a, an ad hoc exercise to, to show you how this is done. But um, some language things to be aware of. Uh, any object that you create in M or with the Power Query interface um, can have spaces in it. You can have special characters in it. And you, you don't have to be all programmer-like. You, you, know, you don't have to um, you know, use camel space, I'm sorry, can't say that, camel case or Pascal case, you know, which is popular in programming. In the BI world, we tend to kind of err on the side of making our code very friendly and easy to maintain. That goes against the grain of, you know, purist DBAs and SQL developers and application developers, but um, it's part of the BI culture. So I guess what I'm saying is get used to it and embrace it. Um, if an object, whether it's a the name of a query or a variable or a parameter has spaces in it, the way that it's represented in code is it begins with a hash or pound sign, and then there will be double quotes around the name after the hash. And uh, those are really the basics. It, it really is very, very simple. It's, it's a language that's pretty easy to figure out and oftentimes just simply um, through experimentation, uh, you know, and uh, you know, you can, you can Google the answers, but there's a lot of bad advice on the web about Power Query just because it's been around for a while and it took a lot of people some time to figure it out. Okay, uh, let's, let's uh, actually do some demos now. So I'm going to find my mouse pointer. That's not the one I wanted. That's the one I wanted. No, it's not. My apologies. I, I opened up all my projects ahead of time and I got myself in trouble by doing that. Folks, I am having some really weird video anomalies here. Um, I, I, I won't try to explain what I'm seeing, but I'm having a little difficulty just uh, maximizing windows that I uh, have on another screen. Shoot, shoot, shoot. All right, let me just try to cycle through these things. Okay, that, that explains it. All right, well, because this is behaving uh, oddly, I think what I'm going to do is just transition to a uh, a different demonstration. So I'll park this on another screen just in case it does open up and uh, behave the way that it should. I am going to show you a nifty presentation. Um, and I'm just going to open, just going to use this file that I have open. All right. There is a, uh, a very interesting website that, and th this is this is actually serious. I, you know, first time I show this to uh, to some people, they think it's a joke. That that you can use to report UFO findings, sightings, and this is called the National UFO Reporting Center, and. Uh, a lot of this data it was actually originally um, gleaned from government records, believe it or not. But uh, this volunteer group, who uh, have kind of been deemed the the uh, authoritative body of UFO sightings in the United States, have assembled a database, and you can go to a forum and let's say that you're, you know, 
uh, out at night and you see something strange in the sky and you, you know, think it's a flying saucer or whatnot, you can go report that. And uh, there have literally been um, hundreds of thousands of UFO reportings. What's interesting about this site is, is, is the way that it's constructed, which makes it very easy for me to scrape data from it. And that's what I'm going to do to demonstrate some of the tenants of M that we're talking about. So I'm going to go up here to this link, Report Database. And uh, there's a link right here, index date posted. Now, I want to show you what one of these UFO sightings looks like. On this page, you can see uh, a list of dates. Um, the, the, the updates occur to the database uh, about once a week, I think, but it's not always very consistent. You can see that the last update was on January 19th. If I click that link, here you see the UFO sighting. So we've got the date and time, got the city, the state, the shape, the duration, and then a summary. The fact that it's UFO da sighting data, you know, is interesting, but what's important about this is this URL right here. Let me go back. Notice that on this list, I just have this static URL. I've copied that to the clipboard using control C. When I click this link, it takes me to another web page and it passes the date that I clicked on into the, the uh, end of this URL. That's important. Now, let's go back to Power Query, and I'm going to say, I want a new source. This is going to be a web source. And I'm just going to paste that first URL. That should give me that web page that has the, the table of dates. So when I click on that, Power Query goes and runs a component that goes out, hits that website, it looks for any tables. It's going to find one HTML table on that page, and it's going to show it to me here in preview. And this will be very, very useful the next time you need to do serious business reporting on UFO sightings. All right, so there's that table from, from the, the web page. You can see that it's regular formed. It has two columns. Awesome. I click the, the uh, checkbox and bring that into Power Query. So it gets named table one. Let's call this um, sightings. Because this is going to, to form the basis of my sightings table within my data model. Now, the next thing I need to do is get that other URL right here. Remember, I clicked on the date in order to navigate to this URL. And if you, you look at the address, you can see the year, 2-1, and the month, 0-1, and the day, 1-9. So that's important. So I'm copying that to the clipboard and New source, web, just like we did before. Okay, we'll find a, a single table on this page. Go ahead and click that, we'll see the preview. This one is a little richer than the, the other table, and we'll click OK. All right. So this one, I'm going to call sightings for date. Now, I, I made a point to not use any spaces here because I, I'm going to use this as a function. Now, let's take a look at the M that was generated. One thing you will notice is that I've turned on some features here. I'm showing the formula bar because I always want to be able to inspect the step that I'm on. And because M is so readable, you can usually just look at the formula and figure out what's going on. Um, so I, I do that in view, but I've also turned on some, um, some, some nice features that help me profile my data and understand the data in each column. And I've actually just kind of turned on all of these features, column quality, column distribution, column profile. So it, it uh, shows me if there are any errors, it shows me how valid the data is, whether it conforms to the right data types. 
It shows me the distribution, really nice features here that are pretty self-explanatory. All right, now that I've done that, I'm going to right click on this last query and I'm going to go to the advanced editor. You'll also find the advanced editor on both the home tab and I think it's on the transform tab as well. Let's inspect this query. I'm going to zoom in. So there's my let and in. That tells me that this is a query that returned, well, it returns a table object uh, simply because the functions that are used here generate tables. So all of those menu options, everything I did in the user interface caused browser contents, which is part of the web object or the web class, it caused that function to be called against this address. Takes this source table now, which was the result of that HTML page, and it uh, it passes that into the um, this function that says, all right, select the table from that page. There was only one table, which I selected, and I went and got that, that table. The details aren't really important. Um, it then promoted headers for me automatically. It figured out the first row was a header and it promoted that for me. So my columns are, are named. And then it did some transformation for me. It changed the data type of the columns that it had figured out. Okay, so why is this important? Well, I want to be able to use this query as a function. In other words, I want to be able to pass the date into this so that I can get back all of the records for that particular date. And all I need to do is go add an input parameter. So I'm going to say open paren, and I'll call it, oh, uh, well, let's call it posting date. I can say as date if I want. Um, you don't have to, to, to use strongly typed names like this. And then we say equals greater than. And that will turn this query into a function. Now I need to do something with it. Now I'm going to declare a variable called um, date string. Now I don't have all of M um, memorized. Let me see if I can zoom in on this and make it a little easier for you to see what I'm doing. I don't have all of the functions in M memorized. In fact, I find that I'm cycling between SQL and VB and C Sharp and DAX and M so frequently that I, I can't remember exactly what goes with what language, which means that sometimes I have to fish around a little bit. Let me see if I can do this by hand very quickly. All right, so my purpose is to take a date value and turn that into um, a six character date. I believe that I can use text.format to do that. Yes, I can, good, I remembered. And you get all the IntelliSense features that you would expect in any Microsoft product. So um, I've just started typing that creates this drop-down list and I can use the up and down arrows and I can use tab. And then when I type an open paren, it's going to give me a little pop-up that says, all right, this is how to use the format function. You pass it a um, format string. Um, so I think we need to pass it a value, don't we? I think we pass it a value first, which is probably that version. I would expect the value to go first, but uh, let's... Try this, and you'll see that that my variables, all of the objects that are in scope, actually show up in my IntelliSense list. Uh, we want year, year, month, month, day, day, and this is consistent with Visual Basic and DAX. The uh, format uh, uh, standards are pretty universal across these different languages. So I'm pretty sure that that's right, even though it didn't really match with what the IntelliSense was telling me. I'm I think it's the other go. way around, Paul. I think Is that it? Yeah. comes first, yeah. Thank you. I'll go fix that. All right. Now, you will say I'm going to zoom out here because it's kind of getting in the way. 
sometimes the editor is a little too helpful and it'll double up quotes and things like that. So we're going to go fix that, actually follow directions this time. OK, let's see if that's going to work. I'm just checking my syntax really quick. That's correct. It needs to be a comma at the end of every line except for the last one. And I am utilizing the um, date string right there. Let's click done. And you'll see that this turns into a function. All right. So I, I, I can't. I can't see the steps for a function because it's all encapsulated, but it does give me this nice interface where I can test it. So let's put that date in. So it was January 19th of 2021. So if this is working correctly, when I click invoke, it's going to invoke this function with the parameter value that I've uh, entered, and it's going to generate a query with the output. So let's see if that works. It doesn't. OK, to you, it's not that I don't believe you, but I'm going to go back and, and reverse these again <laughs> just as a debugging step. <laughs> year, year, month, month, day, day. Uh, month is capitalized because otherwise it would be minute. That didn't work either. <laughs> um, can I convert the value into type text? Why not? Why the heck not? It shows this demo because I knew it would be easy. Um, and, and actually, I, I think this confirms uh, what you were saying is that it well, shoot. You want to Google this for me, Tio? I will try that. Let's see. So I think what you can do, the example that I'm hearing, here, instead of text.format, which it looks like it takes only, uh, you can use date to text. Yeah, OK. So date dot to text. To text, I think it's yep. And then you've got your date, which is exactly in this case is exactly right. And that's that's exactly right. All right. Yeah. Try that. Uh, not date binary, though, just date. Oh, I, that, I picked the wrong item off the list. I get so used in DAX to pressing enter. I always want to press enter here. <laughs> yeah. OK, awesome. That's going to work. Ooh. No. <laughs> okay. Let's try this one more time. Is that the right link? Is that how it should right. be formatted? You see the link itself? No, I I, I think that I actually chose the wrong query. It, it, it did come back. All right, so that that that's working. So, and I'm going to delete these queries just to dispel any confusion. I think you need to change the date. You were doing uh, 1 1 instead of 1 19. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, doesn't matter. We've proven that it works. And, um, now I'm going to go back to my, my sightings query. And because we have a date value here, what I can do is add a custom column. Actually, there's a, a more modern way to do this now, and that's to use this button, invoke a custom function. It doesn't matter what I call it because I'm not actually going to use this name, but I'm going to choose my function. And right now this column is called reports. It would probably make more sense to call that something like report date or posting date or something like that. But um, 
Now, it, uh, the, the first time I do this, the uh, engine or the editor is going to say, hey, wait a second, you're going out to the web and you're calling a bunch of functions on each record. Uh, you're going to have to tell us that it's OK to do that. So I'm just to say, you know what? Uh, it's a public site and uh, I don't need you to be uh, you know, overly protective. We could also tell it just to ignore privacy levels. And that should allow that to run. Now, let's do one thing very quickly. I'm not going to wait for this because we should always filter a table before running a, uh, uh, a complex query like this. So it's, it's actually having to go out and, and run that function, go run the website, get the data for every single date and uh, this data goes back to, um, uh, believe it or not, there are actually sightings recorded from uh, the 1800s. Um, um, who, who was it? One of, one of the founding fathers uh, recorded a, uh, a uh, it wasn't Alexander Hamilton, but uh, anyway, th there's some really, really crazy stuff in here. So I'm going to, um, use a date filter and say, I'm really only interested in seeing sightings from, let's say, 1, 1, 20, 20 through 20, let's say, I am having some really bizarre problems here. I'm sorry. Between, yes. There we go. One, one, twenty, twenty, and one thirty one, twenty, twenty one. All right. Now I've only got a year's worth of sightings, and then that should come back relatively quickly. Okay, so little experiments like this, I mean, you know, it's UFO sightings, it's not, not, not real serious data for most folks, but it's a really, really nice exercise to understand the tenets of M, to be able to get your hands around using functions, converting a query to a function, and also understanding some of the performance implications of um, calling functions in a row like this. So you see, I get a table of records back and I can expand that table just by clicking on the little rabbit ears up here. And let's come back to this rather than waiting for it. Okay. So you saw some evidence of uh, the way that uh, privacy settings work. Uh, deep within the engine, there is a mechanism called the formula firewall. And its job is to protect us from ourselves. It essentially, when you have multiple queries, like the example that I just showed you, the job of the formula firewall is to prevent sensitive information from being passed from one connection to another. And so um, there's this, this isolation that's built in that by default won't allow that to happen. Now, you can, you can override that just like I did. I can say, you know what, these are, these are trusted sources. I'm really not too concerned about them. I'm going to mark them as public, okay? So there's nothing sensitive in there. We can also mark it as organizational, meaning that it, it would uh, conform to the standards of our organization. And um, uh, if you're on a domain join machine, you're part of an organization, there are actually rules that can be managed by your administrator. 
Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of intricacies to the way that privacy levels work. Something that's very important to understand is that the way that the formula firewall is managed within the Power BI service can be far more restrictive than on your desktop. And the takeaway there is that if you build a, a complex query where you have to override or set these privacy levels, test it in the service before you commit to it. I've, uh, I've developed projects using uh, web API calls and nested functions that simply weren't supported in the service. So a lot of a lot of folks in the community have blogged and shared their experience about such things and just understand that there are some restrictions. OK, all right. So we've we've seen some examples of queries that work well against small result sets. But if you're working with larger result sets and you're working in a more enterprise environment, it's important to design for scale. It, it's, it's OK to do things quickly and even maybe a little bit sloppy if you're only working with small sets of data. But um, you know, it's, it's important to exercise some, uh, some discipline otherwise. OK. There was a question earlier about what kinds of operations are intensive. Those that require all of your data to be loaded into memory, and especially things that, that reshape the data like pivot, unpivot, and transpose in particular, uh, are, are, you know, they're, they're limited. Let me um, attempt to show you, I'm gonna close this website. And let's just verify that that back results and see that this, there we go. So there are all, all of our results for the dates that I had selected earlier. Okay. Earlier this year, um, I set out to build a Power BI report that would help people analyze uh, COVID cases. And um, the, the data set that we've all grown accustomed to, to seeing um, uh, is hosted by Johns Hopkins University in a GitHub repository. Essentially what they've done, done is, is uh, their uh, data science, and uh, I forget the, the name of the department. They have a dedicated department that collates data and uh, and uh, makes data sets like this publicly available. And essentially, what, what they have done is they've gone out to the Center for Disease Control there in Atlanta, to the World Health Organization, uh, to every state in in the US to, to other federal government sources. And they put together that data set that you see on the news all the time that shows how many cases, how many deaths, how many recoveries, um, you know, that kind of thing. Let me just show you, let's do a time check real quick. Ooh, it's about, uh, Tio, am I correct in that uh, we're, we're pretty close to being at time? Uh, we can go for like 10 minutes, something like that, Paul. OK. It, it, look, I'm, I'm not going to open up this um, project, but what I will show you is that um, importing a, a collection of CSV files, so every single day, Johns Hopkins would report about um, uh, 4,000 di different geographic entities, which included U.S. states, Canadian provinces, uh, there were a number of different countries that were down to the province or state level, Australia was included, and then every country. And so about 4,000 records per day. And then, of course, you know, one file every day to bring all of that data together using a technique somewhat similar to the UFO example, worked pretty well for about six months. And then it just started slowing down and slowing down and slowing down until it just simply wouldn't refresh anymore. And so the solution um, is to back up and use a different architectural 
approach. So let's close some things down here real quick. So the solution was to take all of those CSV files and to um, push them into a central store. So essentially what I did is I, I used Azure Data Factory to, um, to send all of the CSV files into a data lake and then pick them up and insert them into a SQL database. Um, quick, easy to do, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have this to demonstrate, but um, but um, what that really allows me to do is run a query that was taking, you know, literally 20 minutes, 30 minutes to process every day and to be able to run that query in mere seconds. And then we could partition it. And that takes us to a very important feature that is now available in Power BI regardless of of the uh, the version of Power BI or the way that you're licensing Power BI, and let me talk about query folding and incremental refresh. And I I'm, need to find the uh, file that I'm looking for. I'm sorry that with the video problems that I've been suffering, that I'm having trouble finding this. I just need to close a few files. Okay, that's in demo one. Put that on the bottom of my slide so that I can see it. So, in SQL Server Analysis Services, um, we've had the ability to partition tables or partition, um, you know, back in the day dimensions, um, you know, for a long time, as you think about building enterprise scale solutions. Since Power BI literally sits on top of the um, SQL Server Analysis Services tabular engine, um, we we have the 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 ability to do that, but you don't have to um, work real hard to create these partitions. All right, I'm ready to show you this now. Okay, as a SQL guy, let's say I'm thinking I I want to build a Power BI solution, and I think to myself, you know, I I know how to optimize a query. I'm a SQL guy. So if I need to join a couple of tables together, I'm going to do that in SQL, right? So let me jump over to uh, SQL Server Management Studio, which I have way down here. And uh, let's say that I need to join uh, my uh, customer table to my online sales fact table. And I'm gonna do that right here. Wait for that to wake up, right? So we'll just take that SQL. So I've already done this. I'm not going to demonstrate it. So I'm going to take that SQL and I'm just going to drop it right here into a new query and run that. Okay, awesome. Now I've got millions of rows of data and uh, it's taking up too much memory, the file's too big, and I'd like to use parameters to pare that down, all right? So I've created a pair of parameters here, range start and range end, and I've created 
a row filter on my date key, which is a date time column here. And you can see this is up in the formula bar. Let me zoom in on that. Up in the formula bar, you can see that, that range parameter. And guess what? It doesn't work. And the reason that it doesn't work is that when I use a native query, when I type SQL into a new query, that essentially tells Power Query just to throw its hands up in the air and say, um, fine, go run that query, bring all of the results back, and then do all of my transformations in memory. If it brings back 10 million rows, fine, bring back 10 million rows, and then we'll do our filtering, our grouping, and any other transformations after the fact. If rather than doing that, apologies, if rather than doing that, I can connect either to a table or to a database object like a view, then um, we don't have to bring back all 10 million rows. Let's see if I can stop this from running. There we go. All right. On each query step, you can right click and you should be able to see if query folding is enabled, you should be able to see the query that Power Query generates against the data source. In this case, since I'm connected to SQL Server, it ought to translate all of my steps into a T-SQL query, but it doesn't because I've used a native query. Now, in the case where I've just connected rather than using a, a native SQL query, I've created a view that does exactly the same thing. Okay, there's my view. It's exactly the same query, but you can see I've created a view. When I use a view, you see that there is a native query generated. So let's take a look at that real quick. Here it's essentially a select star from the view. But After I've added my filter step using those two parameters, view native query is still available. And you can see that it, it keeps changing my T-SQL query. And it has actually created a where clause with that range of dates. I could continue to add additional transformations. In fact, I could do transformations that break query folding and the, the, the query generated by Power Query will be executed all the way up to the step where I do something silly like a, an unpivot or a transpose columns or something like that with a reduced uh, result set. Then, this will be my last part of the demonstration. I do need to get Power BI desktop now. Then we can go out to the right step and choose incremental refresh from the ellipsis menu. You have to follow the directions. The parameters have to be named correctly. They have to have the right data types. But if I've done all of those things, I can turn on incremental refresh. And then we'll say, all right, I want um, to create uh, 24 yearly partitions. And then process the last, oh, not years, I'm sorry, those are months. But I always want to reprocess the last two years. We're just going to bring rarity lower than the overall granularity. Keep choosing years. All right. And then I'm going to apply that. When I deploy this to the service and I process it in the service, it, it's going to run 24 individual queries. The next time I run it, it's only going to run three individual queries that are parameterized with the beginning and end of each of those months. Okay. 
and uh, you can actually tell it to detect changes. Uh, the point is that it's going to be faster, it's going to take less overhead, and I have more control over how my data is being managed. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, like I said, I will be um, posting to my blog um, a presentation based on a lot of this same material. And it will include a wrap up of these best practices. So briefly, um, if you're using a supported data source like uh, a relational database like this, you want to use tables or views rather than native queries. Always use parameters, but you have the option of using parameters with the incremental refresh feature. Go to the, the documentation and follow the directions. It's easy to do, but you have to follow the directions and uh, kind of do it, do it the way that it was designed. Remove all unneeded columns. The best way that you can improve performance and memory use and file size is to get rid of any columns that you absolutely don't need, especially if they um, don't, don't support a lot of compression. So, you know, unnecessary text columns, memos, uh, those kinds of things typically don't belong in a data model. Um, and uh, then we talked about consolidation. We talked about using the, uh, the, uh, the counters to be able to figure out when your queries run fast and when they don't run fast. Do your transformations in Power Query rather than DAX. And I'll go ahead and wrap up on that note. Yes, Paul. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you, there is a question here. Can you share the link to the blog? Can you put that in the chat window, please? I will. It's actually right here. SQL Server BI blog. Okay. SQL Server BI dot blog or SQL Server BI blog dot com. Both will take you to the same place. Awesome. Do you guys have any questions for Paul? can unmute your mic and I actually had an unrelated Power BI question. OK, so are there any tutorials in Power BI that you would recommend? <laughs> I realize that I have a lot to catch up on. If if you will go to my my blog and I I hope I don't sound too self promoting. That's that's not why I'm doing this. You know, my blog is where I, I share anything that I have to say about, about BI. Um, over on the, on the left side, there is a link called Best Practice Resources, uh, Blogs and Books from the Experts. And um, these, these were actually gleaned from uh, a, a fellow MVP by the name of uh, Chris Wagner had put together this uh, this, uh, oh, what does he call the mountain of the data gods? Uh, Tio, you need to be on this list. You should absolutely <laughs> be on this list. A mission. Um, <laughs> so we have, it, we have it, to fix that, Paul. <laughs> yeah, we do have to fix that. I'll, I'll reach out to, to Chris. Uh, anyway, but, but, but here you can see resources like, um, you know, Alberto and Marco, who of course are extremely well known, uh, you know, Adam and Patrick, uh, you know, Guy in a, clue, Guy in a Cube. Chris Webb, et cetera. Um, so see, these are go-to resources that I would strongly recommend. Um, part of, I think, the Chris's criteria in, in, in promoting these experts is that most of these folks have training classes and video series and, uh, you know, uh, books. I mean, Tio, you've written so many books, I can't count, though. Um, but anyway, that's my answer. Uh, go here. Um, at the end of this post is a list of some of the books that I, I recommend. And I, I, I'm, I'm feeling just absolutely embarrassed, Tio, that I'm not including it's your okay, Paul. Your that's book that's here. fine. I, I you know <laughs> I, I understand that. Uh, but also I want to add guys for just to give you a tip here for the um, for tutorials, I mean, the best tutorial in my mind, uh, if you want to have something self-guided, is to get the dashboard in a day, um, mm -hmm. kind of download it. And maybe I can put the URL here. Should be akams.diat, if I'm not wrong. 
So that dashboard in a day, it's a training that Microsoft updates on a regular basis. I teach a lot of this, but it's kind of designed as a self-paced um, uh, uh, kind of document with a lot of steps. So you can go and actually download the content uh, and just go steps by yourself. Um, and Power BI, okay. And that's it. Any other questions for Paul? It's been a long day. Well, Paul, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. We definitely have to do this again. I know I have to return the favor to your group. <laughs> you, you were leading the the uh, the Washington uh, BI group. Is that right? Um, we so we've we've recently kind of re realigned. Um, so uh, I've been part of uh, Oregon SQL, the the past chapter. Okay. Um, for the past 10 years. Um, however, we, okay. we just transitioned to what we call uh, the Oregon Data Community. But uh, amid COVID and, and everything being virtual, we've actually consolidated all of the user groups in the Pacific Northwest. So we are now the Pacific Northwest mm. Data Community. Okay. And we meet uh, on the third Wednesday evenings of every night. So. Uh, Right now, we're putting up a new website, but if you went to uh, Oregon sure. SQL .org, um our schedule is is out there. Awesome. The question from Taruka, any resource preparing for DA100 exam? Near and dear to my heart because I'm asking my people actually to go and certify because Microsoft is changing some requirements. So besides what Microsoft lists on their website as a preparation, I would say uh, nothing particular comes in mind, Taruka, but you could um, you could get one of this uh, uh, you know preparation guides like Measure Up. I think have a good one, and some of the others. I think that should be pretty valuable. Um, at at the end, the most important thing is the uh, experience with Power BI. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. You know, some of them very tricky, as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. So real life experience probably will be the best advice. Paul, do you have anything to add for DA100? Which you is know, I, I took DA100 when it was in beta and there, were, you know, there yeah. were no, no resources whatsoever. I, I found it to be a pretty realistic um, measure of experience, you know, and though there were the, you know, the, the normal kind of double negative questions and things that, that make you think twice before you answer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if if there is a book or a guide. I don't think that there is yet. What, what I will say, being cautious of information that uh, we are aware of under NDA with Microsoft is that there are some new learning resources that should be announced very, very soon mm -hmm. that will be focused on the new set of certifications. They will be free and they will be um, very concise and really designed for you to work through self-paced learning in a short period of time with the goal of passing a certification exam. Gotcha. Was, and was that appropriately stated to you? Uh, I, <laughs> I think that's pretty good, Paul. But uh, when when do you think this is gonna come up? Come um, it's it's in it's in preview to uh, to uh, some small groups of folks right now. So very very soon. Gotcha. Okay, sounds good. Uh, another question from Tanya. Tanya, is there a way to copy all the chat posts since they're so valuable? As far <laughs> as I know, there is an easy way to copy all the chat, but they actually remember it in Microsoft Teams if you go to your history. Paul, do you know if there is a way to copy all the chat messages? I, I just tried to do this and I couldn't figure it out. I had to go <laughs> and, and just go back to an old meeting. And I, I actually um, just copied, um, you know, the whole page and pasted it into Notepad++. And even though the formatting was horrendous, all of the text was there. Ah, just yeah. 
Control Control A, Control C. Is that what you did? Something like that. I don't know if I scrolled up to the top and tried to to swipe across it, but it was something like that. I, I had to mm. play with it quite a bit. It, every every um, yeah, emoticon took up an extra row, and so that was kind of painful. Got you. Uh, and there is a question. Actually, it's for me. Uh, where will the recordings be available? So the recordings are available at this URL. All the recordings that we started doing since the um, uh, since we went digital. And for this one, I'm going to probably it's going to take me an hour or so. I'm going to upload it. But if you go to that URL, you'll see all the recordings is, uh, in there. OK, any other questions? Well, thank you guys. I'm going to thank you for joining us today, Paul. I appreciate it. It was great reconnecting you um, in this remote and digital uh, world. Um, I'm going into the next one, guys, again, is March 1st. Uh, and have a, have a wonderful time until then. Good night, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you all someday. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul.